In this section, we're going to discuss a type of stereoisomer. This type of stereoisomer appears in ring molecules and in molecules with double bonds. In a later section of lecture, we're going to learn a, another type of stereoisomer that we're also going to have to learn how to name, but that's for another day. The type of stereoisomer we're going to discuss is called a geometric isomer, but in the older naming system, we used the terms cis and trans to identify them, so we often call them cis-trans stereoisomers. We're going to continue to use the cis-trans naming system for stereoisomers when it's appropriate because it can be very easy to see and very quick. However, again, especially for double bonds, we're going to see that there's a newer system that is more complete and applies to more molecules. We're going to start with cis-trans stereoisomers of ring molecules. So, cis-trans stereoisomers, as I mentioned earlier, are a type of isomer called geometric isomers. Geometric, or, geometric isomers are a type of isomer that occurs because we have bonds that don't rotate all the way 360 degrees. For some reason, their rotation is restricted. And because of that, we get groups that are locked into a certain three-dimensional relationship that if they could rotate, they could take the opposite. But because they can't rotate, they can't take the other relationship. Geometric isomers are a type of diastereomer, which is a type of stereoisomer that we're going to discuss in a later chapter. And when we discuss it, we will mention them again. Ring compounds have restricted rotations around the bonds of the ring because if you try to rotate around a given bond of a ring, uh, 360 degrees, you would have to break the ring. We're not allowed to do that. So they can only rotate within certain limited boundaries. To understand the stereoisomerism, what we have to do is we have to imagine that the ring is flat and all of the atoms of the ring are lying in a plane. Now we're going to see that this is probably not very accurate for most rings, but it's a very useful way to imagine the ring for this discussion. If we have a flat ring, we could look from the side of that ring. This picture is an attempt to show a side view of a five-membered ring. It's in a particular style of drawing called a Haworth projection. And in this drawing, what we do is we draw the ring in sort of a perspective where the bonds that are close to us are a little bit heavier, the bonds that are back away as we're looking on the side of the ring are a little bit lighter, and then perpendicular to the ring there would be two bonds. This would represent the V that's attached there, but instead of drawing it as a V, we exaggerate that bond angle to show one pointing straight up and one pointing straight down, just to really exaggerate the fact that one bond points toward one part of the ring and the, uh, the other bond points toward the opposite. We then have a name that we give to sort of this top flat area above the flat ring and this top area or bottom area below the flat ring. We call these faces. So this would be the top face of the ring up here. This would be the bottom face of the ring down here. And what we can see is that the attached bonds are divided evenly. One points to the top face, one points to the bottom face, all the way around the ring. I've only drawn two of them, but really there is there are these attached bonds on every atom of the ring. Now, we have another way of drawing a ring to show this sort of stereoisomerism. What we can do is imagine that the ring itself is flat in the plane of the paper. In that case, this bond, I'm uh, sorry, in that case, the top face would be the face that's pointing toward us and everything in front of the paper would be in the area of the top face. 
To represent that then, we would use wedges because groups that are pointing toward us are wedges. So the upper bond here, which points to the top face, would become a wedge bond over here. Similarly, if we look, the bottom face would be behind the plane of the paper. To represent things behind the plane of the paper, we would use dashed bonds. And so the lower bond here pointing toward the bottom face would become a dashed bond there. Either way is perfectly acceptable. They have each have their uses and their drawbacks. You should basically try to become comfortable with both ways of drawing a ring. Now, when we have exactly two substituent groups on different hy uh, sp3 hybridized carbons, in other words, different tetrahedral carbons of the ring, we will have cis trans isomers of the ring compound. When there are three or more substituents, we cannot use cis-trans. To identify the ring stereoisomers, when we have exactly two substituents on two different atoms of the ring, we compare the relative locations of the two substituent groups. So we look at our drawing of the ring, we identify the substituents, so for example, this methyl and that methyl. And if we look, they're both pointing up, so they must both be on the top face of the ring. So we would say they're on the same face. So the stereochemical designation for these when they're on the same face is cis, which is one of the Greek or Roman prefixes meaning same. Now, I have them both uh, on the same face, the up the top face, but they could both be on the same face, the bottom face, and they would also be cis. So it's just the fact that they are on the same face, whether it's the top or bottom, that's important. So if we look at this molecule then, we would say this is a cyclohexane. It has two methyls, one at one and one at four, and they're arranged cis to each other. The second example has one methyl on the upper face, the top face, but the other methyl on the bottom face. So what we would say in this case is that the two methyl groups are on opposite faces. When the two groups are on opposite faces, we say they are trans. So this molecule, or this molecule, would have cyclohexane, it would have one methyl, 4-methyl, so 1,4-dimethyl, and then it would be trans. So can you see that these molecules are extremely similar? However, because of three-dimensional relationships, they are stereoisomers. To indicate whether a ring is a cis or trans stereoisomer, we write the word cis or trans at the very front of the name with a dash separating it from the substituents, from the parent name, etc. It turns out that double bonds also can exist as cis-trans isomers. If we look carefully at this picture, we can see that here is the double bond. If we imagine a line going through there, which I will draw in a later picture, we would call that the bond axis. These methyl groups are on the same side of the axis of the double bond. In this structure, they are, if this is the double bond axis, one is on this side, we could call it the upper side, and one is on the lower side. It turns out that in theory, you could just can interconvert between these two structures by rotating. If I take this methyl group and I rotate everything so that it's down here and the hydrogen is now up there, I would get the other molecule. But we're going to see later because of the way these are double bonds are made, you cannot rotate around a double bond. And so these actually become two completely separate molecules, completely different molecules that are geometric isomers of each other. So again, to distinguish between geometric isomers, we're going to use the prefixes cis 
and trans. And so we're going to do cis and trans naming on double bonds. I do need to warn you that cis and trans naming on double bonds will not work for all double bonds. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Well, in order to do cis and trans naming, what we have to do is we have to look at the groups that are attached to the double bond carbons. So going back to our example up here, if we look, the left-hand carbon has a methyl, a CH3, and a hydrogen. The right-hand carbon has a CH3 and a hydrogen. What we would then do is we would look and we would say, is one of these groups on the left-hand carbon identical to one of these groups on the right-hand carbon? And the answer in this case is yes. In fact, we have two possibilities in this case. We could say the methyl is identical to the methyl or the hydrogen is identical to the hydrogen. What we're going to do then is compare the relationship between the two groups that are identical. Now, if we don't have two groups that are identical, one on one carbon, one on the other, we're not going to be able to do cis trans naming. If we have two groups that are identical but both attached to the same carbon, we won't have cis trans stereoisomers, we won't do cis trans naming. The other thing is that if all four groups are different, we cannot do cis trans naming, even though it will exist as stereoisomers, and we're going to learn a new naming system for that in a later chapter. Okay, so once we've identified our two identical groups, what we're going to do is compare the locations of those groups. To do that, we're going to draw something we call a bond axis. A bond axis is the line that directly connects the center of one atom that's in a bond to the center of another atom that's in a bond. So essentially it just draws a line aligned with the bond. So in this molecule, the bond axis would be right here. In this molecule, the bond axis would be right there. In this molecule, the bond axis would be right there. What we're then going to do is compare our two identical groups. So in this case, the two identical groups would be these two hydrogens because here we have a methyl, here we have an ethyl, so those are clearly not identical. But we have a hydrogen on the first carbon, a hydrogen on the second carbon, so those are totally able to be compared. If we look at those two groups, then we can see that if this is the bond axis, they are on the same side of the bond axis. Therefore, we are going to say that they are cis. This is the cis stereoisomer. In our second example, our two groups are not hydrogens, they're methyls. I have a methyl on the first carbon and a methyl on the second carbon. If we look at our bond axis, the first methyl is on the lower part of the bond axis, whereas the second methyl is on the upper part. So they are on opposite sides of the bond axis. Therefore, we will call this the trans stereoisomer. In our third example, if we look, we have a chlorine and a methyl group on the first carbon. We have a hydrogen and an ethyl group on a second carbon. So we don't have two groups that are identical to compare. So we can't do cis trans naming for this. Again, to indicate the cis or trans designation, we put that in front of the name separated by a dash. And actually, usually they're italicized and to do italics in writing, you usually underline them, but I'm not that much of a stickler for that. Many people don't really do that. So our example here would be this molecule. We have one, two, three, four, five carbons. We're gonna number from the left-hand side so that the lowest numbered carbon of the double bond would be two. So five carbons is penta, but we're gonna drop the A. We're gonna put in the the suffix for the double bond, which is ENE, -E, and then we also have to put in that the double bond starts on carbon two, so pent to ene. Now what we're gonna do is look at this carbon and see, is there a group on this carbon that's identical to a group on this carbon? And the answer is yes. Each carbon has a hydrogen, which is very common. Now we have to look at the bond axis. Now, because of the way this molecule was drawn, the bond axis is not perfectly horizontal. 
Instead, it's at an angle. It's the line that connects this atom to that atom. So it's just basically totally parallel to that double bond. In this case, then, you can see that one of the hydrogens is on this upper side of the bond axis, whereas the other one is on the lower side of the bond axis. They're on opposite sides. So therefore, we would name this trans. And we would write that in front of the name.